All right, everybody, welcome back to this video. We're going to go over left, left posterior fascicular block, which are also known as hemi block. Any fascicular block is a hemi block. So you could also say this is a left posterior hemi block. And so go ahead and check out my first video on the left anterior fascicular block. That'll help you understand the anatomy a little bit better. But let's just briefly review. So the fascicles are branches off of the left bundle branch. So they're going to come off of our left bundle branch. So if I zoom in on our limb leads here, which is a coronal view of the heart, off of the left bundle branch, you've got running infraseptally, you know, a little bit on that infraseptal posterior aspect is our, this is our left posterior fascicle. And then running more on the anterolateral wall of our left ventricle is our left anterior fascicle. And remember, these are all fibers that are conducting signal rapidly through the ventricles. It's a part of that Hisperkinji system, the highway system of the heart. And these run on the endocardial. surface of the heart, the deepest layer, which is just important to know for one, normal anatomy and depolarization, but two, how when they do fire off, how they will affect the vector <clears throat> of depolarization. And so today, when we go over the left posterior fasciculum block, we're going to be talking about when this posterior fascicle is damaged or blocked, what is the morphology of the QRS going to look like? Because this is going to be uh, depolarization of the ventricles. And so, in posterior fascicular block, the impulses are initially conducted to the left ventricle via the anterior fascicle, because we know that signal is being sent um, effectively through those fibers. And remember, those are in the kind of the upper lateral, upper lateral aspect of the left ventricle on the endocardial surface. And so depolarization initially, when you're on the left upper lateral, Depolarization initially is going to be up and to the left because we're going deep to superficial. We're going from the endocardium to epicardium. So these fibers are running around, they're wrapping around, but they're wrapping around the endocardial surface. And so when they do fire, they're going to fire laterally through the rest of the myocardium. And so as you notice, where this is headed to, this is going to produce an R wave in the lateral leads. But it's not going to produce a very large R wave in these lateral leads, lead 1 and ABL. It'll just be a small R wave because this is only just a small portion of the ventricle. So that's not going to be a very strong um, amplitude. And so we'll get another small R wave in this lateral lead. On the other hand, in the inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF, you can notice that this signal is going away from those leads. So you're going to get a small Q wave. Small Q wave. And it's small because, remember, this is only just a small portion of the ventricle. This is not a lot of tissue, and we know that the amount of tissue correlates to the amplitude. And so then, we're going to have the major wave of depolarization as the rest of the ventricle depolarizes. And the rest of the ventricle is going to depolarize from those cell to cell junctions. It's going to take a little bit longer, but it's going to be spreading all through this left ventricle, cell to cell, all the way through the septum. Right, and this is all in the left ventricle. All right, our right ventricle is okay because we've had a right bundle branch that's working well. But we know the left ventricle is a very muscular 
uh, organ. And so if you look at the vector of depolarization, what is this going to cause? Well, if we look at our lateral leads, lead one and AVL, these signals are going away from those leads. And it's a strong signal. So we're going to get deep S waves as a part of our QRS. And on the inferior leads that these are pointing towards, we're going to get taller R waves. And so that is how we get the morphology of a left posterior fascicular block. Notice our axis. We have right axis deviation. So you'll see right axis deviation in the left posterior fascicular block. So you need to rule out right ventricular hypertrophy as a cause before you can say that this is a left posterior fascicular block. All right, let's take a look at an example. So here we've got a normal EKG. We look through, we see regular rhythm. We got P's for our QRSs. They're upright in one, upright in ABF. So it's probably sinus P wave. We've got normal PR interval. And so let's take a look at our QRS axis. I see that my QRS is downward in lead one and upward in AVF, so that means it's going down to the left, which is, or down to the right, excuse me, which is right axis deviation for our QRS. And on that right axis deviation, the first thing I should think of is what's my differential diagnosis? Is it right ventricular hypertrophy? So I look at V1. And I see in V1, I should have an R wave that's greater than 7 millimeters for RVH, which I don't see. It's just a small R wave. And so I'm like, okay, I've excluded RVH. Let's maybe look at fascicular blocks. And so when I look at lead 1, I see I've got this small R wave, which represents the depolarization that is being caused by our left anterior fascicle, which is healthy in this case, right? So we said that that creates small lateral R waves in one and AVL. On the other on the other end, it creates a small Q wave in the inferior leads, which I see in my inferior leads, small Q wave. And then as depolarization, now we've got a, our wave of spread just after that occurs towards the, the region that was supplied by the posterior fascicle, which is the inferior septal kind of posterior aspect. So we're going to get deep S waves that are away from those high lateral leads and towards those inferior leads here. And so because we've ruled out other causes of right axis deviation and this fits the morphology that we would expect, we can say that this is a left posterior fascicular block. So I hope this helps. Have a great day.